Hello and welcome to this edition of Cato Connects. I'm Caleb Brown. I'm the director of multimedia here at the Cato Institute and host of the Cato Daily Podcast. Today we're talking about the North Korea summit held in Singapore now almost uh, two days ago. The highest level talks there were, of course, between uh, North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un and U.S. President Donald Trump. And to talk about that, I'm speaking with Eric Gomez. He is a foreign policy analyst here at the Cato Institute. And Doug Bandau, he is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and has visited uh, North Korea on multiple occasions. So, uh, gentlemen, we have some questions uh, coming in from uh, folks via Twitter and uh, the Facebook. And uh, if you would like to ask a question, you can use the hashtag Cato Connects. And if you don't mind, also include uh, my uh, Twitter handle, C.O. Brown. You can also ask questions via Facebook as well. So uh, just a general question here. The walking out of this, well, I guess let's go back a little bit and just say, what was anybody expecting to get out of this brief uh, meeting and of course the, the the levels of discussion we only saw really one of them but we there were several levels of discussion among the the two regimes but what did we expect what did people expect to get out of this and what should we have expected um, I had pretty low expectations going into it uh, I thought that given the time pressures involved and uh, how much time the two sides had to actually work out differences before it happened and the fact that it almost fell apart a couple of weeks before it did happen uh, meant that we weren't going to get anything too concrete and we didn't get anything that concrete. It was a pretty general statement. Uh, there were some agreements to work towards bigger principles uh, with the details being left for later, which is fine. I think that it's fine that the summit produced what it did and that it's going to signal the start of a longer process. Doug? You know, we, they had five hours together, max. If you, you know, look uh, from the initial meeting of the two through the working group through the luncheon. That's not much time. And I think the starting point was they did this the wrong way around. Traditionally, when they hold summits, you have lots of meetings in advance. You work out the details. You bring the principles together. They sign the big, thick document. Everybody hugs each other, and you proclaim success. This one, we had the big meeting at the start. Well, no one thought that uh, you know, the President Trump was going to negotiate inspection regimes for denuclearization. So given what they put together for the summit, I'm not at all surprised at what we got. I, mean, I thought it was going to be pretty thin. I have to admit that the document they came up with was probably slimmer than I had expected. But in a sense, it does what we expected. It commits them to denuclearization, and then it says, now we'll work it out. And that's what it was always going to be. Right. Is it, uh, is it wrong for uh, commentators, people who are in the foreign policy establishment, to look at this and say, come on, why couldn't you, got, why couldn't you have gotten any more out of this agreement? I suppose, on the other hand, you know, you got uh, you know, North Korea there. You've brought out Kim Jong-un in an important way. He's seen the potential benefits of dealing with the world. That, uh, you know, they, they're going to continue, we presume, the uh, no-test uh, uh, regime for both nuclear weapons and missiles. That's a very positive thing. You know, destroying one of the test facilities, even if it was perhaps not a very good one, is something. So we got a few things. This, this meeting was never going to give us the kind of concessions that people want in terms of a detailed commitment to denuclearization. Hugely complex process. You know, another small concession here or there wouldn't have mattered very much. The follow-on always was going to be the big thing. All right. So uh, a question here from, uh, let's see, what is his ID? It is Three Point Grotto. He asks, and maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves here in starting with this, but do you see North and South Korea becoming one Korea anytime in the future if the promises uh, laid out in this document hold up? I think the promises laid out in the document are a necessary precondition for any reunification, but it's certainly not sufficient. Um, and I think that it would be a little premature to say that or to predict that that would happen even within uh, our lifetimes. Um, but I think that if you are going to get there eventually, you're going to have to resolve the <coughs> nuclearization issue of North Korea. There are two issues here, one of which is the North Korean regime, the North Korean elite have no incentive for, for reunification. They lose. Who needs them? The point is, if you have reunification, the South Koreans win. They have the money. They have the opportunity. They take over you're lucky if you don't end up hanging on a lamppost. So Kim Jong-un has no interest in reunification. And the second is actually in the South, there's a lot of nervousness. Who wants to spend the money? And you worry about the political impact. Bring in 25 million socialists to your political system. Mm -hmm. You know, the right may never take power again in Korea. 
Uh, the uh, let's go to some some of what the meat of that document essentially is. Uh, there are four points here that are the specific lines of uh, agreement. Uh, number one, the U.S. and the DPRK commit to establish new relations in accordance with the desire of the peoples of the two countries for peace and prosperity. Two, the United States and the DPRK will join their efforts to build a lasting and stable peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, three, reaffirming the April 27th Panmunjom Declaration, the DPRK commits to work toward complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And four, the United States and the DPRK commit to recovering POW MIA remains, including the immediate repatriation of those identified. So um, which of those is the most uh, surprising, interesting, useful, or pointless? Uh, for me, it's numbers two and three are, what? Um, num- are the most uh, interesting Okay. Um, or the most promising. Number uh, Because those two talk about the existence of a broader peace regime. Um, and the third one talks about the Panmunjom Declaration that South Korea had. And when we're looking at what is going to happen next, I think if you, we want to have hope, we need to see what's been different now than past negotiations. And I think that the role of South Korea here is very important and it's very different. Moon Jae-in is incredibly popular. He's early in his term and they had local elections yesterday and today uh, and his party is cleaning up shop there. So he has a strong mandate to continue with diplomatic engagement with the North. And that is something that the South Koreans have never really had. Um, so the fact that those things are included in the uh, joint declaration that the that tr- Trump and Kim got is important because it shows that South Korea's role is very important in all this. And I think that's one of the sources of hope uh, for me going forward that this time will be different. The most practical issue, of course, is the remains of American military personnel. A very emotional one, a very powerful one for anybody who's been in the service or anyone who's lost, you know, someone who is in the service. So I think that's a positive, but it's not to the big issue. I mean, that's something that's helpful. The, uh, if you look at the third uh, issue of denuclearization, of denuclearization in the Korean Peninsula, what we mean by denuclearization matters. The Koreans, North Koreans have always talked about on the peninsula. That suggests they mean they want to get rid of the U.S. nuclear umbrella over South Korea. So that definition matters a lot. That's going to be one of the biggest issues in the future. What exactly is denuclearization? But I think Eric's absolutely right that the South is going to help drive this. The South, for example, wants to see a peace treaty. It wants negotiations for a peace regime. These are things President Trump will have a hard time not bringing into the agenda because both North and South are likely to present them. And President Moon's gained a lot of credibility in this. He helped put this together. All right. So um, what's the role of China here? Uh, People, China, I think, did ultimately provided air travel uh, for the North Korean delegation to uh, Singapore. Uh, Doug, you know, if I hear you correctly, uh, when you talk about the problem that uh, North Korea poses, that letting China and South Korea really take the lead in in making sure that uh, North Korea can potentially be someday reintegrated into uh, that world uh, is what we ought to be hoping for. So what's been the role of China and what do we expect it to be down the road? Well, China, I think, has played an interesting role here. It looks to me like they were worried about being cut out. You know, they basically ignored uh, Kim for six years, tightened up sanctions. He never visited. And then suddenly within a couple of months, he had to you know, uh, you know, summits with uh, President Xi Jinping. The fact that Chinese provided an aircraft shows they were backstopping the North Koreans. You know, I've heard now the, North, the Chinese are talking about maybe sanctions, at least some sanctions should be lifted on the North Korean regime. So they appear to have come in pretty strongly, essentially telling the U.S., we gave you what you wanted. You wanted the meeting with this guy. You wanted them to come forward. You wanted an agreement on denuclearization. You got it with our help. Now we want you to respond. So China, we're going to have to deal with China. They can help make this process a success. We need to take that into account. I think the Chinese are signaling that the era of maximum pressure is effectively over, referring to Trump's policy of very tight sanctions and also uh, military drills, frequent military drills and um, sort of statements against North Korea that were pressuring it to the negotiating table. China always viewed its own sanctions as a means to diplomacy. Now that diplomacy is happening, they don't feel pressure to keep those sanctions on and will probably become more lax over time in terms of enforcement and also push for them to be lifted. Um, Another interesting role of China in all this is that I think North Korea might be trying to find different options for friends. 
uh, right now. Traditionally, they have been very economically dependent on the Chinese, but we're seeing in the Panmun John Declaration and also with this general outreach of diplomacy with the United States, I think the North Koreans are trying to diversify their diplomatic contacts a bit um, and get other countries involved so they're not completely as reliant on China as and they And that's not were. a new policy. They've long played the Soviets versus the Chinese. When I was there last year, they talked about not wanting to be economically dependent on any single country. It was clear who they meant. Mm -hmm. Bringing the U.S. into the picture gives them an alternative. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, well, you talked about the uh, playing the Soviets against the, the Chinese. How did that actually work? I assume this was under the previous regime. Yeah, well, this is during the Cold War. The question of who they cuddled up with, who they talked to, where they sought to get support. I mean, they had very bad relationship, you know, with the uh, the Russians after a de-Stalinization, but they had a bad relationship later under Mao. They tried to talk to the other side. They tried to work with the other side if they could. China's the dominant power there, but they always looked for alternatives. All right. So um, what are we to make of the criticism that's been leveled against uh, Donald Trump for essentially saying nice things or saying complimentary things about Kim Jong-un? Is that something that is to be worried about, or is that just how you do diplomacy? Part of it is just how you do diplomacy. Another part of it is that what, what do you expect him to do, just insult the guy to his face in their first uh, meeting? So I think that, uh, you know, Trump's praise for Kim, people, some people are not going to like it because of, you know, oh, he's cozying up to a dictator or whatever. Um, but I think the uh, overall point of direct communication and direct negotiation with North Korea, that is the way to go now. Um, and I think that that is a much needed step if the United States really wants to get to denuclearization. Yeah, I think there's an over the top quality for what the president said. This isn't the first time presidents have done that. I was always appalled to have the U.S. president holding hands with the Saudi Arabian king, talking about what wonderful friends they were, knowing how they treated their own people and what the dictatorship was like at home. You know, talking, essentially saying you're a bosom buddy, talking about how wonderful, talented, and smart this guy is, really is a little much. But I think Eric's absolutely right. The main thing is to have communication. Imagine if we'd gone through the Cold War without talking to the Soviets. If we had talked to the Chinese in 1950, maybe we could have avoided the clash we had in Korea. We want to be talking to him. The president deserves credit on this. I think, you know, for all the criticism, which is a lot of it's justified, he was the one who made the decision. He made the change. And yet uh, we have to take seriously the fact that this is a state in which people are subjugated to mm -hmm. one of the, the highest levels the world currently knows. Uh, you know, uh, malnutrition is a, is a huge problem and people are not, ex they don't have speech rights, the right of property, things like that. So we have to take, we have to take those things seriously. Uh, how do we, how do you thread that needle in terms of, you know, providing a public face where you're, you're, you're maintaining those open lines of communication, but at the same time, you're taking very seriously the fact that there are crimes being committed here on a, on a daily basis in North Korea against people. Well, I think you do two things, one of which is you have no illusions. I mean, my hope is the president does not view them as having this really extraordinary relationship and a special bond, as the president said, that he really doesn't spend a lot of time thinking that Kim Jong-un is so talented and smart and everything else. This is, as you indicated, an awful regime. We have experience in that. We had to deal with the Soviets. We dealt with uh, Mao Zedong. We've dealt with the Saudi Arabians. We a lot of these folks are really awful. So what you do is you do have no illusions. The second is you make human rights part of your dialogue. You don't make everything dependent on it. If we don't solve the nuclear problem, we're not going to change them on human rights. But you want that to be part of the dialogue. You want them to know we watch. You want them to be embarrassed. You want them to know that the world watches. And especially to the extent that Kim is interested in kind of being on the international stage, we have an opportunity on this because I think he can be embarrassed. If he knows this will be brought up, then suddenly he has an incentive to start making at least some changes at home that ease some of that criticism. There's also a balance to be struck between what you talk about publicly and what you talk about behind closed doors. And I think that it would be a good thing, especially at early stages of negotiation, to press the North Koreans on human rights issues, remind them, like Doug said, remind them that we are watching, remind them that this is something that the United States cares about. But at the same time, don't air it out in public, at least right away, because you don't want to give an excuse for them to pull out the negotiations and just say, you know, we're being insulted on this and it's, we're not, we don't want to talk about it. So keep that conversation uh, in private for now. John Schwartz at The Intercept 
uh, wrote, and I'm just going to read the headline here. He says, who cares what Trump gives North Korea at the summit? What matters is preventing him from starting a nuclear war. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of truth to that. One of the great things about this summit is it's made it almost impossible for the president to go back to where we were last fall and be threatening war in a number of ways. One of which is the South Koreans are not going to you know, find that at all acceptable. They didn't like it last fall. But you know, as uh, Eric indicated, there's been a transformation within South Korea. From their standpoint, for the U.S. to threaten to blow up the peninsula would be horrendous. And I think it's very hard for the president to come back to the United States and tell the American people, oh, well, never mind that nice meeting we had and all the good things I said about him. I think we have to go to war. And I think that's a very important step to pull us away from that. It was very dangerous. Both sides on edge, danger the North Koreans think, use it or lose it. There are a lot of reasons to be nervous at that point. One of the great things about this summit is it has pulled us back. And I, I don't think we're going to be at that precipice again. I think it is important, though, to draw the distinction between that. Yes, we aren't in that place that we were last year, but Trump also put us in that place last year. Right. Uh, there wasn't really any there wasn't really much consideration of an imminent nuclear war or nuclear exchange with North Korea until Trump implemented his maximum pressure policy that had absolutely no level of public engagement with the North, which just sort of backed them into a corner. <laughs> Um, Locked and loaded, I believe, yeah, was the term exactly. used. Yeah, yeah. So Trump's, Trump does deserve some credit for getting us back from the brink, but he also put us at that brink in the first place, and we shouldn't forget that going forward. All right. So if you have questions for uh, Doug Bandow or Eric Gomez, you can use the hashtag on Twitter, Cato Connects. You can ask questions via Facebook. And if you would, please uh, tag me, C.O. Brown, in your questions via Twitter as well. <coughs> What's step two? I mean, the, the discussions, you know, we have Mike Pompeo, who's, who visited uh, North Korea sort of quickly and secretly for a little while to help set up this mm -hmm. this meeting. I, I think it the, the South deserves most of the credit for making yes. this mm -hmm. event actually occur mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and keeping this keeping the movement toward this event uh, on track. But moving forward, what uh, what do you view as the proper steps to secure this perfectly reasonable agreement that was, in general terms, was laid out this week? Uh, number one, keep the conversation going. Uh, I think Pompeo is going to be the point person on this for the U.S. government. Uh, he should, um, as soon as possible, have meetings with his counterparts to start hashing out the details of the agreement. Uh, number two, keep or get the U.S. ambassador to South Korea confirmed already, mm -hmm. uh, Admiral Harris and send him there to Seoul to have a better relationship with the South Koreans. One thing that's been really bad for the United States since Trump took office is the U.S.-South Korea relationship has suffered as Trump has talked about trade issues and also has done some things without apparently consulting the South before he does them. So we need to fix that immediately. Um, I think those would be the, the first two steps going forward. Yeah, I think establishing a communications process. And my hope is that part of that would be consideration of official relations of some sort, we should be talking to the, again, including the South Koreans, the question of a peace regime, negotiations on a peace agreement, that would require the Chinese as well. And we need to th you know, start thinking in terms of, I think not just, oh, they will denuclearize, meaning everything. This is a long process, a very difficult process. But thinking about intermediate agreements, I mean, I want to formalize the prohibition on nuclear and missile testing. Let's get that you know, done where they agree to it. You know, let's talk about getting inspectors in, even if it's on a limited basis. Let's, we need an inventory of their nuclear assets. So we need to start coming up with kind of a list of things that we want to get the process rolling, as well as what we're prepared to give them mm -hmm. in terms of some sanctions relief, trade, involvement in international organizations. There are a number of things we can offer and say, so you give us some stuff. You get something. How do we move things where they see a positive? And to me, that's a critical thing. Warm feelings will fade very quickly. We have to make some concrete steps here so both sides perceive we're making progress. And what should we, uh, you know, not be willing to give up in here? Uh, you know, the, the foreign policy is difficult. <laughs> and uh, trying to get to yes on uh, a difficult question, which is, uh, you know, having watched what happened in uh, Libya, having watched the, what happened in Iraq, and North Korea is perfectly reasonable to mm -hmm. want to yeah. keep their nuclear weapons at, at basically any cost and use movement toward an agreement to get whatever concessions they can and uh, at some point get angry for some reason and mm -hmm. then shut off communication again. Is that, I mean, that seems to be a, a pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do we avoid that? 
I think the U.S. needs to be willing to put some things on the table that we haven't put on the table before. Um, what you're asking of North Korea is to say, listen, we want you to peacefully surrender the best defense you have against us. We want you to purposefully make yourself mm -hmm. more vulnerable to an attack. And in exchange, so far, the U.S. Uh, expert community has sort of been like, well, we don't want to reduce our alliance with the South. We don't want to – That people got very jumpy when Trump said that he would – uh, cut back on military exercises with South Korea, for example. And you can't ask that big of a thing from North Korea and say, but we're not going to give up anything of, of substance either. Um, that would be, I think, really foolish. And that would be a, just a path to another failure in, uh, uh, another failure of negotiations. Yeah, we have to set priorities. And to my mind, denuclearizing the North is worth a lot. We've claimed that for a long time. And in fact, it is important. So we have to be prepared to put a lot on the table. It's mm -hmm. worth sacrificing a lot. There aren't many things that I would say are off the table. I think the question of U.S. troops and the alliance, I find it extraordinary to have people say, I'd prefer to have a North Korea with nuclear weapons than to consider bringing U.S. troops home, when in fact South Korea, 45 times the GDP, twice the population. I mean, this is a country that can handle its conventional defense. Let's think about this in terms of the opportunities. If this is what's necessary to convince the North to play ball, I say let's put it out there as opposed to rule things out and make it impossible to reach a deal that maybe Kim is willing to make. I'm still skeptical, but it'd be wonderful if we could get that deal. Uh, we're not going to show it now, but of course, uh, Donald Trump <coughs> showed Kim Jong-un a video <laughs> that was uh, meant to lay out the stakes of getting this right or getting it wrong. Um, have you seen it? No, I, I have. I have. Oh, tell us about it. It's... It's something. Uh, it's <laughs> there's lots of very odd imageries that sort of <coughs> generically associated with success. A lot of playing up Trump and Kim as individual leaders, you know, saying things like two men who are on a mission of peace. Can they do it? Can they pull the world back from destruction? Uh, it's pretty corny. Uh, to be quite frank. Well, but the president also showed off his limo. I assume yeah. that that was part of saying you too could have a big limousine like mine. That, that may have been <laughs> part of the effort. So, play, it, I mean, but that doesn't seem at all counterintuitive to me either. The, the idea that you play up the fact that, we, you know, these two men are somehow great men and uh, by virtue of their authority, they are great. And uh, we need by bringing you into the, your country, into the modern world, you get to be a part of the modern world and get the respect mm -hmm. uh, that you deserve. I mean, oh, I that think, sounds reasonable to me. No, look, I, I think it's a great argument. I haven't seen the video. So the question is the presentation. I think we've seen a lot of that. People have complained, oh, we're legitimizing Kim. Well, to my mind, Kim has suddenly seen the advantage of being a respected international leader. He's met twice with the uh, South Korean president, twice with the Chinese president, met the U.S. president, has an invitation from the Russian president. He's seeing himself on an international stage. This is one of the things we should play up, that he and his country have all these opportunities if they want to join us. And that's part of the security. That's part of the kind of guarantee for them. You do that. And suddenly you have a lot more friends and a lot more opportunities. Mm -hmm. You want to integrate North Korea with the broader community of nations, show them that <coughs> it's better to be inside the tent than out. Uh, I think this could play into it. Although so it really is quite the video. So I encourage you all to watch it. <laughs> uh, so, Doug, you've seen uh, – you've been to North Korea twice. And most recently, uh, you know, just give us a sense of what you uh, got from the people that you talked to about – what they want in terms of a relationship between the United States or between North Korea and other Asian countries? Well, Kim came up with a policy we call the parallel policy, the Byung-Jin policy of nuclear development and economic development. He recently said we've finished the uh, nuclear development, now we focus on economics. And that, I think, was the overriding lesson from my trip last year that they worried about security, that they talked about Libya, they worried about what the U.S. had done. That was on their minds. They didn't want to let it happen to them. But that clearly Kim cares more about economic development than his father or grandfather. And you could see that in Pyongyang. The countryside is still very poor. But Pyongyang has more money. New construction, private automobiles, people have cell phones, people could buy food on the street. Women, not men, were still very plain, but women dressed very nice, high heels, skirts, hair. I mean, there is a change. This is a very different place than when I'd visited years before. 
So I think that that's been communicated to the elite. They've tasted the good life. They want that. I think Kim understands that to be a powerful guy, have a real country, he wants that as well. And that's an advantage for us. That's the opportunity. Here's the positive for you. So to what extent is uh, the regime or Kim himself compromised in a way by the elites in Pyongyang? Well, Kim's problem is that they no longer control information. 25 years before when I was there, they controlled information. Today, among, you know, it's a much more porous border with uh, China. You know, you come in with flash drives. Uh, lots of people have seen South Korean soap operas. That's all you have to see. You know you've been lied to. So his challenge is how do you manage rising expectations? That's always the danger for any authoritarian regime. I think that's his biggest problem. The people know things that he doesn't want them to know. They want more. How do you satisfy that? And that's, I think, why he wants economic development. It's still a, you know, a strongly authoritarian state. Uh, China is still a strongly authoritarian state, yet managed to emerge out of uh, you know, the mass slaughter to become uh, a country that is extremely productive. It's a massive economy. Uh, they're a massive trading partner with the United States. They hold a lot of U.S. debt. Um, is that what Kim is hoping for? And is that the best we could hope for to end up with state capitalism uh, eventually out of North Korea? I think broadly speaking, Kim recognizes that if you want to have, there's many different aspects to survival. And part of survival is military power, but the other part is you need to have something that is self-sustaining and something that you can pass on to future generations. And I don't think it means that, like you said, I don't think it means that South or North Korea is going to liberalize anytime soon. I think Kim is doing this to keep his family in power as long as he possibly can. But if you have the economic development, you have economic growth, it does add another layer to security of the state and does make it a little less uh, dangerous and sort of unpredictable that we've seen it in the past. In a sense, that's where he's moving. You know, the Chinese tried to convince his father to do this. They'd bring him to Shanghai and say, look at what you could have. And basically, Kim Jong-il would go back to Pyongyang and say, no, thank you, because he worried about the political consequences. So Kim Jong-un has clearly made that calculation. I've got to open up to some degree. And of course, he spent a couple of years being educated in Switzerland. I mean, we don't know an awful lot about what he brought back from that. He loves the bulls. That's why Dennis Rodman was over in Singapore tearing up about the, the latest summit. But I suspect he came back with an appreciation for kind of the wealth and prosperity of Western society. And that may also help him. So I think, at least in the short term, that's where we're looking. Long term, I hope for reunification. I hope for a democratic North Korea. I hope for one that's really part of the democratic West. In the short term, I'd be happy if North Korea moved to China, that that would at least give us and give the North Korean people very important advances. And uh, it, it, it should be noted that uh, Dennis Rodman has been a friend of Kim Jong-un for some yes. time here. Shane Edge. Uh, says on Facebook, I've also had to reevaluate Rodman's character after watching him in the CNN interview. The initial reaction was that he was a fascist sympathizer rather than just trying to bring that sort of country into a modern world. And of course, he's appearing on television wearing a MAGA hat, wearing a T-shirt with uh, mm -hmm. a, a marijuana cryptocurrency <laughs> uh, on it, talking about uh, relations between the United States and North Korea. I honestly think that Dennis Rodman's role here is not to be diminished or should not be uh, made fun of exactly. No, I think you're right. Actually, I have a friend who helped bring him over on his earlier trips who has, I mean, Dennis has his problems on, in certain ways, but he's, he's not a dumb guy. And in fact, his intentions here are good. And that he, I think he has played a positive role that again, anything that can move the North Koreans and the leadership toward the West, towards more freedom ideas, towards reform, any of that is positive and should be encouraged, even Dennis Rodman. Yeah, I think when it comes to North Korea and the United States and trying to figure out a path forward, uh, um, experimentation or some kind of thinking outside the box is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I think we need to try things that we haven't tried before, and it applies to the sort of state-to-state -state relationship, but also things like this, uh, things like athletic diplomacy, if you want to call it that, um, or even just personal relations that typically are sort of poo-pooed by other experts. Now, and of course, we have not mentioned the Olympics at all here. You're, you're no. sort of making reference to it, but that, that seemed like a pretty big deal for mm -hmm. uh, North Korea to at least attempt to present its best face 
uh, to the world uh, in a way that it had not really done before. Well, it had double significance. In 1988, South Korea had the Olympics, and North Korea did its best to try to torpedo those. The last uh, you know, incident we know of, a terrorist incident, was downing a South Korean airliner in 88, trying to spread fear and prevent people from going to Seoul. So South Korea was very nervous with this Olympics. I mean, the you know, Olympics grounds were not that far from North Korean border. The question was, would the North Koreans try something similar? So the fact that the North kind of made its offer in that context you know, mattered an awful lot. That that was a kind of an assurance to South Korea, made it much easier for South Korea to respond positively. And I think you're right that the North Koreans saw a positive response to them, and that allowed them to go further. And I think President Moon felt good out of that and felt empowered and could also promote it. All right. So uh, final thoughts on where you expect this to be, this uh, relationship emerging. Um, will Americans be more likely to visit uh, North Korea uh, down the road? And, you know, to what extent can the United States facilitate simply a better relationship among individual to individual between these two countries? I think having some level of people to people exchanges again would be a great thing. Uh, getting just individuals sitting down at the table together, even if it's just through tourism. Um, I think that moving on to like the broader political situation, uh, what comes next is hammering out things, getting the hard work done, getting specifics on paper, um, getting agreements signed and implementing them with verification. Um, so it's going to be Welcome to welcome to the beginning of the beginning, everyone. Uh, it's going to be a very long road ahead with many potential downsides. But I think that I, I really do think that this time is different. And I hope that um, we can keep the momentum going. The U.S. both bans Americans from going to North Korea and North Koreans from coming here. Those bans should be lifted immediately. And then I think the question of constant, regular contact, diplomatic contact of different sorts, moving the agreements forward and talking about other issues of importance. That is a step that moving in that direction helps move us in the right way. And I'm hoping for good things out of it. I have no illusions. It's going to be a long and tough process, but at least we're moving in the right direction. Uh, a question here from, and I'm sorry, I'm going to mess up the name, so I'm just going to ask your question. I apologize. <laughs> if North Korea denuclearized, the next key security issue would be the Taiwan Strait. Would it be easier for the U.S. to take a stance to, to defend their ally, Taiwan? Um, well, I think that the Taiwan, so this is one thing that advocates of maintaining a U.S. troop presence in South Korea argue, is that the U.S. troop presence is necessary to deter China from doing other things in the region that aren't just in the Korean Peninsula. So the alliance is sort of broadly stated. Um, I'm not sure South Korea has much appetite to get itself involved in such a hypothetical conflict, um, and U.S. forces would be relatively far away to be too useful. Um, so that's something that we should consider as we you know, think about the U.S. alliance structure in Asia. Um, what can these units actually do in a conflict scenario, and if their usefulness is being overblown? Yeah, in practice, neither South nor North Korea want to play a role for the rest of, you know, for the China or the United States in a potential conflict. The Taiwan's, I think, in many ways, a very hot uh, spot, a very dangerous spot today. And the U.S. is going to have to decide what it's willing to risk. Are we willing to, willing to risk going up potentially to nuclear war against, you know, China over an issue that it views as vital, a core interest? This is going to be a very real challenge. All right. We're going to leave the conversation there. And of course, we'll talk more uh, down the road about it. If you would like to listen to uh, this conversation, if you missed a portion of it, it will be available as a Cato Institute daily podcast. You can uh, subscribe there, cato.org slash podcast. Uh, thank you to Doug and Eric for joining us. And if you have any comments, questions, concerns, complaints, uh, you can email those to me, uh, cbrown at cato.org, and I will be very gentle uh, in responding as best I can because I genuinely do want uh, as much feedback as possible. And we'll talk to you again next time. All right.